How are you doing? Hey, how, how, are you? how have you enjoyed UDS so far? This has been our best UDS by far, actually. I've had a fantastic time. We had such an amazing vibe, so many interesting, complex conversations, but also I think a lot of those conversations have borne fruit. So, uh, so I'm, I'm really, really chuffed. What seems different about this UDS then? Um, well, it might just be that I, I didn't have any jet lag because I, <laughs> I was in the time zone for long enough beforehand. So it's been, uh, it's been, it's been fun. I think the venue's been great. Um, it, uh, it's kind of tight enough that we sort of all feel together, but it's also sort of spread out enough that you get a little bit of fresh air on the way, hopping between sessions. Um, and I think there are, enough, there are enough people who've come to enough UDSs now that we can have lots of tracks where you've got real detailed conversations going on between thought leaders, you know, people who really know this stuff, know the platform. Um, there's been a lot of participation here from quite a few different companies, which is interesting. I, I guess that may have something to do with being in the Bay Area. It's just mm -hmm. easier for companies to get people here. And so I've really appreciated that because we, 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 we get a lot of clarity on what other organizations are doing. It helps us deliver the platform in the right direction for them. It seems to have been quite an uh, expansive six months for Canonical. There seems to have been new teams formed and um, lots more people come into the company. Are those really starting to make an impact now? I think so. I mean, it takes a while for people to sort of learn the ropes. Um, um, we, we have been hiring people now who... Who, who didn't necessarily come through the Ubuntu team. And so there's quite a lot for them to learn because Ubuntu is a sort of rich and, 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 and diverse platform and project. Um, when we hire folks from the community, obviously they hit the ground running from, from an Ubuntu perspective. They have a lot of deep knowledge about how that machine works um, and folks coming from outside don't have the benefit of that. Um, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of excitement about Linux and free software um, and, and a sense that, that we've been given the opportunity to... Um, to, to, to challenge the status quo and to, and to show that free software can actually deliver something that people want to use. Um, and that's very exciting. That's something I think we should take seriously. It seems to me that um, Ubuntu is really maturing um, as, a, as a community and as a, as a project. We're getting teams now who's, who are sort of specialising in areas that you wouldn't normally see in a free software project, mm -hmm. like usability, like testing. Yeah. Um, and that... Although we believe, you know, we're already competing with big boys, it, it feels as if we're a, a more mature community yeah. that is on the same level as those other companies. Well, I hope that maturing doesn't mean we're getting, uh, we're getting a bit of a waistline, a bit slow off the mark, yeah. <laughs> a bit but, balding on the top. Um, um, but we, we, it's definitely rounded out. Yeah. Um, um, your, your comments about testing are interesting because um, I've, I've really come to believe that if we want free software to challenge proprietary software, we have to figure out how to, how to make the most of our kind of distributed kind of chaotic development, mm -hmm. while at the same time finding practices that mean we deliver quality sort of out of the box without, without having to have a very heavyweight QA process. Mm -hmm. And I believe sort of testing, automated testing, test-driven development and so on are kind of key practices in that. So we've started trying to champion that idea. The Linux Foundation has done... Has done a, a lot of work in figuring out how to build test suites for almost everything that's that's at the heart of the free software desktop. Um, but there still remains a lot of work to be doing to be done in, in in working with the upstreams to socialize the idea of tests being a really important thing. Right? Mm -hmm. They do they do make you think more carefully about the changes that you're introducing. But um, in the longer run, they actually help you produce a more structured, organized, better quality product. So, so. And you're also looking at some big changes to how uh, things like the repositories are packaged and are moving everything into revision control. Um, is there going to be enough capacity within the, the Ubuntu team and the canonical people to, to do that without disrupting Jaunty? Oh, I think I mean, there are always disruptions when you, when, you, when you shift your processes and change your processes. Um, for a long time, I've been a, an advocate of distributed version control because it um, it removes the sort of hard line between the, the inner core of committers and everybody else. You know? It creates a, a, a very level playing field, a smooth playing field, where you know, anybody's work is equally, um, has, has equal tool support, if you want to think about it that mm -hmm. way. And when it gets merged into the platform, if you're using something like BZR, you can see exactly who did the work, even if they weren't kind of a core committer. Mm -hmm. you know, that stuff isn't washed out in any way. Um, so that gives you a much more... Um, a, a much more, a much smoother on-ramp to your community, right? You don't go suddenly from being outside to inside. You can ramp up your participation, and, and no matter where you start, you're a first-class first contributor. So it's really exciting to be able to do that at something the scale of Ubuntu, to have every single package across the whole of Ubuntu in version control, 
um, and particularly a version control system which has that very nice property, I think is going to be very interesting. Um, and with it, it creates opportunity for, for us to change a number of sort of, um, of the social practices and social structures. Um, I, I think we're only just at the beginning of that. You know, we'll start out with something that is basically modeled on what we had before, where we have main and then we had universe and additional sort of, uh, sort of areas of expertise. And I think we will we'll, we'll, we'll build that into a more general, sort of more contiguous um, framework, social framework. I talked to Julian Hubbard earlier in the week mm-hmm. about his, his role. Um, did you perceive there was a need for uh, better branding or more consistent branding or, or, or his, his particular role in team? Or does it just seem Julian, to Julian Hubbard is a canonical head of design and user yeah. experience. Um, branding wasn't so much the driver of, of creating um, that role and the team around Julian, um, so much as a desire to really help the free software elevate the, uh, the, the state of the art in, in the free software uh, desktop. There is a tremendous amount of amazing innovation and work that happens in projects like GNOME, in projects like KDE, and in individual applications, right, with people testing out really interesting ideas. Free software is like that. You know, Genius has all of the tools that it needs to sort of express its ideas. Um, what is difficult is trying to um, uh, take those flashes of genius and turn them into coherent, consistent bodies of practice. Um, and so I think we need we need a dedicated team to do that, to help participate in the work that's going on within GNOME and KDE, and also to show within Ubuntu how we can do that across this enormous uh, this enormous range of packages. Um, so so Julian's team will grow quite large. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they'll end up with uh, nearly 10 people working across the web, across the desktop, and across um, sort of other media you know, where, where, where branding is part of it, but it's not the whole story. Mm. Um, I really hope this makes a big difference. It's going to be interesting because instead of instead of simply packaging you know, mm. or simply packaging KDE, we're actually going to be saying, hey, we really want to do things slightly differently. Um, it's, it's clear to me that we shouldn't abuse our position as kind of the last stop on the railroad before that code ships out. To, uh, to use this. We shouldn't have used that position just to make the changes we want mm-hmm. without consultation. Um, we need to make sure that we're engaging with GNOME and with KDE. That's why, we, that's why there are a lot of GNOME and KDE people here. That's why Canonical people have been at the various hackfests focused on user experience. But it's also because we, because we have the whole desktop um, uh, uh, sort of within our embrace, we're able to do things that are slightly harder to do within just GNOME or just KDE. And we will be a big driver of trying to find common common expressions, common technologies, common approaches um, that benefit the whole free software desktop community and not just members of one community or another. It's a really exciting opportunity. We're not so big uh, a community and Canopo is not such a giant company that it's impossible for one team to impact all those areas. So it's totally feasible to have a a nice consistent feel and consistent thought process behind all those different areas. In theory, yes. Um, Certainly within Canonical. Mm. Um, And it helps that, you know, they... I'm a personal champion of what they're doing, right? I mean, I, I, I work with that team. I'm really enjoying that work. It's fascinating stuff. Um, and, you know, they will, they will have backing to do whatever they need to do within Canonical. But what's more challenging is looking out across the whole free software desktop. You know, we, we, we touch so many different pieces of software written in so many different toolkits from OpenOffice, Firefox, yeah. Gnome, KDE, XFCE. There are a ton of different... Um, fairly well articulated philosophies that are all sort of brought together on the free software desktop and we have to figure out how to synthesize those in a way that's not constricting but which is also which is sort of empowering. I mean even looking at packages that are shipped in main there's a huge range of stuff to do never mind universe (laughs) getting a consistent look and feel between all those different products that would be in universe would be just huge. There's a real hunger for the stuff though you know um, so Matthew Paul Thomas wrote this great blog article about placating users with options, and he's had a bunch of upstreams contacting him and saying, hey, let's work together mm-hmm. on how we do how we do user interface design. And so that, that team at Canonical is kind of open to um, working with upstreams completely separately from the stuff that we're doing within Ubuntu. Just it's great to have professional expertise that, mm-hmm. that upstreams can tap into to say, how do, we, how do we do this better? I think there's a real hunger for... for, for um, and that expertise, because people want to produce beautiful software. They want to produce software that gets, you know, that gets used. And there's a there's an increasing level of respect accorded to people whose software is really usable. You know, mm-hmm. it used to be that you you got a lot of respect if your software ran super fast or did something freakishly complex. The reality is, 
you know, most people out there don't need software to do stuff that's freakishly complex. Mm -hmm. Most people need stuff you know, to be freakishly easy to use. Um, and I think people started to realize that it's actually really hard. It's a real challenge to make software that's easy to use. It's, you know, they say it's 10 times harder to make a piece of software that's easy to use than it is just to make a piece of software that will mm -hmm. work for the developer. And, and classically, we've, we've, we've done a works for me kind of attitude. So 10 times harder to get to the point where it's, you know, where, where, where it's something that would turn heads. And it's inherent in the free software thing of scratching one's own itch. Right, so how do we, how do we, how do we m make that itch persist until it's something which is truly beautiful, right? And, uh, and that's, that's kind of the key challenge for that team.